This is a review of the picture questions from um, Natural Disasters Midterm Exam, Fall of 17. Um, what picture one shows is a situation where freezing rain is occurring. This is a very unusual um, sort of atmospheric situation in which an approaching warm air mass, a warm front, has created a warm air layer well above the ground. It's in between the normally cold atmosphere way up and a cold layer of air near the surface. You can see that same um, idea in the temperature profile where the temperature in this case is actually getting warmer um, with elevation um, and then it turns around and returns to the normal pattern of getting colder with elevation. What happens to a snowflake in this situation is, um, and remember that all precipitation starts as ice or snow crystals, um, the snowflake falls through a, uh, the warm layer and melts into a raindrop. So that's, that's unusual in the, in the winter time anyway. There's a raindrop. Then the raindrops continue to, um, to fall, but they pass through a cold layer. What happens to the raindrop as it falls through this cold layer is it becomes super cooled, which means it stays liquid, but its temperature is actually below freezing. It's a very unstable condition, and as soon as that raindrop hits the surface and splashes and spreads out, um, it immediately changes phase and becomes solid in the form of ice. So that's, it's important that, to mention that the raindrops in the cold layer become super cooled because they stay as a liquid and are therefore able to splash and create a coating of ice. If this, if this cold layer were thicker, um, what would happen is the raindrop, w r the uh, snowflake would melt to a raindrop, but then the raindrop falling through a thick cold layer would turn into a, an ice pellet or um, sleet, which is um, an annoying precipitation, but nowhere as near as um, dangerous as freezing rain. So the fact that this is just the right thickness to supercool the raindrops is very important. The second picture shows um, the, a hydrograph, is a, a one word description of it. It shows the flow rate, the highest flow rate for each particular year. Um, in a particular creek, Mercer Creek. And what this shows is, importantly, um, that the flow rates are increasing dramatically over time. And an analysis of the data um, using just this data set would give a much smaller result for predicting a big flood, the 100-year one, one, the flood, than this data set would. Um, it's likely that the reason that the flow rates, the flood, flood rates are so much higher in later years is that this watershed, or the watershed that uh, this creek drains, had become much, much more urbanized in the years after um, 1980. So this is uh, an example of land use change affecting the, hy the uh, hydrograph, the flood peaks. Um, and it's important to mention that, yes, that the flood flow rates are dramatically higher after 1980 than they are before 1980. Picture number three shows a, uh, the beginnings of a landslide or an imminent landslide. This is uh, the type called a slide. Um, this is a fault or a break line. You, one can see right here. This indicates that this entire huge slab of the mountain is um, very unstable. And since it still seems to be holding together, it, it is called a slide, and it's likely that, uh, that this, at some point, perhaps due to an earthquake or a heavy rainfall, um, that this entire chunk here will let go and fall into this water body, a consequence of which may actually be a tsunami. Picture number four shows the, form the areas where hurricanes tend to form and the paths that they typically take, although of course we know that they can choose any path um, that they want to and they're not always this regular, but these are typical paths 
that hurricanes take in response to large-scale prevailing winds and the yellowish areas are where they tend to form. It's notable that there's no formation of hurricanes anywhere near the equator and um, it's also notable that they tend to travel toward the pole in, from whichever um, hemisphere they happen to be in. These are, tw these are hurricane paths and hurricane formation areas. Picture number five shows the uh, effect of wind on the spread of a wildfire. The key thing is that the wind makes the flames go sideways and makes the heat energy from the burning material and the flames go more sideways than straight up. This heat energy that the wind is pushing sideways um, preheats and uh, preheats and prepares new um, parts of the of the forest or the wilderness to burn. So the wind is blowing heat directly to the unburned material, heating it up, preheating it, getting it ready to burn. Additionally, um, the uh, embers and chunks of flaming stuff um, can get blown from the tops of the trees further and enhance what's called the spotting effect. So this picture illustrates why winds make wildfires spread much faster. Picture number six um, shows something called a red flag warning, um, which is um, actually a, a very specific thing. It is a warning of um, wildfire conditions. So um, at this time, April 15th, 2015, there was a widespread warning for um, likelihood of wildfires in uh, eastern New York. And this was due to uh, a particularly dry spring which left all the dead vegetation from the previous, um, the previous growing season um, ready to burn. So the vegetation was very, very dry. It's uh, perhaps unusual to, or maybe not anticipated, to think that upstate New York could have um, red flag warnings and have an issue with wildfires. But the fact is that we, we do have wildfires. Um, anybody who mentioned that, uh, that um, having this type of a warning system in place helps people to be aware of and to prepare for and to respond to natural emergencies um, earn some extra credit on top of what they would have gotten otherwise. So um, if you knew that it was wildfire and you discussed why this weather service um, forecast and warning maps are useful, that was, a, that was a very strong answer.